Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So some of you might find it ironic that uh, I'm preaching on gathering on a Sunday in which we can't gather in person due to heavy rains that have muddied the front lawn of the church and due to mindfulness to health precautions which suggest that gathering inside is not quite safe for us to do just yet. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we returned to gathering for worship on the front lawn of the church, and we're already running into complications. This is probably not quite what many of you hoped for when the session announced that we'd be returning to worship in person. So keep in mind the audience of today's text from Isaiah. The original community listening to these words, they have just returned to their homeland after many years in exile. Some of their friends and family have decided to stay behind in Babylon. But those who did return brought with them hopes and dreams of rebuilding the temple, rebuilding their lives, returning to normal. Now, the first chapter of the book of Haggai, written around 520 BCE, describes this newly returned people. and how they faced drought and famine and hunger and economic distress. The early attempts to rebuild the temple failed. It was probably not quite what many of them had hoped for when it was earlier announced that God was preparing a way for them to return home. Paul Hansen asserts that the major portion of Isaiah chapter 56 through 66 arose against the background of the severe hardships that prevailed in the time between Sheshbazar's unsuccessful early attempt to rebuild the temple and its completion under Zerubbabel in 515 BCE. These 11 chapters complement the bleak picture painted by Haggai. They describe bitter enmity between rival groups in Judah. So remember that there were some who remained behind during the diaspora, and it would seem that they clashed with the returning exiles over how to live and move and worship and rebuild in the nation that they all called home. See, God commissions real human individuals and communities to the task of redeeming the lost and renewing the fallen. But as we well know, human involvement in God's plans has a sordid history. There's a popular meme that compares professional cake designs with amateurs' attempts to recreate them fairly disastrous results, and the tagline, nailed it. Such as this, or this one, or this one, or this one. I could keep going with those all day. They're fantastic. And I imagine that must have been something like the experience felt by the prophet looking at God's vision for bringing people home and regathering them in Jerusalem and what actually happened. The passage from Isaiah 56 that we looked at today kicks off this final section of prophecy focusing on the theme of how to not give up when returning isn't what you hoped it would be. How to continue even if you feel you haven't nailed it quite, 
quite yet. So it begins, act justly and do what is righteous. So we're dealing with a community that is fearful of losing the promise of God's salvation because they haven't nailed it. And they're blaming this on the unrighteous behavior of many of its members. But I can imagine that there may have been some temptation between the Jews that have recently returned and the Jews that have remained in the land over which group is the righteous one, ours, and which group was unrighteous, theirs. But lest either group get too full of themselves or too cruel towards those they thought were wrong, or too cruel towards those who thought differently than they did, Isaiah offers up an unexpected model to remind this community exactly what justice and righteousness looks like. The immigrant. If there was any sort of squabble between these two groups of Jews over who was righteous, the word used here would have hopefully shocked them into humility. Nechar means exactly the opposite of Jew. A Gentile, a foreigner, and I can't help but hear a pretty powerful subtext in this shocking exaltation of a non-Jew as a model of who will receive joy in God's house of prayer. It's like God saying, you have become so concerned with being right that you have forgotten what it means to be righteous. Those petty and fruitless squabbles over who is wrong and who is right are exhausting, and they hardly ever teach us anything. Learning to step away from them and instead turning to the Lord for guidance and wisdom will make it so much easier to not give up on the difficult task of rebuilding that lies ahead. Isaiah continues, Keep the Sabbath and hold fast to the covenant. Righteousness is not about where you come from, what you've endured, where you live, who your family is. I mean, you could say that it is, but that's really wrong. And it lays the groundwork for dangerous prejudices and superiority complexes to form. The only righteousness God is interested in is the righteousness that comes from how you live. How you use the freedom you've been given to love and serve God. Make worship central to what you do. That you have time to rest and recharge in the presence of God's love and wisdom. My house will be known as a house of prayer for all peoples. When scripture says all, it means all. God said God would bring people to receive joy in God's house of prayer. Now paired with this verse, I begin to see God's plan for all of creation. Captured in the lyrics of a favorite Christmas carol, God wants to bring joy to the world. Now imagine if we were able to stop worrying about being right and focused more on being righteous. If we were able to follow the lessons of our Lord who taught us to love God and love one another. What if we were able to rest and recharge weekly, in the presence of unconditional love and unfathomable wisdom? What if we were able to approach God knowing that God's love will not turn us away, but is available to all? Now, God's love might challenge us a bit. It might ask us to let go of a few things, but it will not turn us away. What if we trusted God's grace? What if? I think if we were to do all of that, that, we might increase in joy. And I imagine that joy and the spirit in which we share it would draw folks in, would inspire them 
to listen to and to learn from the Lord that has made us so happy, so joy-filled, and so at peace. In our joy, God will gather still others to us. And in that gathering, where all are welcome, where God's name is loved and God's Sabbath is kept, in that gathering is God's great joy, the wholeness and completeness of God's shalom.